I listen. I don't take these things personally. Um, the uh, in, in politics, emotions can run high from time to time. I haven't read uh, the speech, um, and uh, so I won't comment on its uh, substance. Okay. Now maybe I can get back to uh, a question on um, on the provisions itself. Uh, how are we? Through? Two minutes. Thank you very much. Um, one of the one of the complaints, I guess, or the criticism that the NDP opposition has is on um, the plans to take away vouching and do away with the election ID card. They feel that's going to disenfranchise, I think David said, 100 or 200,000 people. Well, of course, there's two options. One is to present a government-issued photo ID with name, such as a driver's license. That would be the most common. And the other, of course, is the 39 other options, where two of which of those 39 would be sufficient. On the driver's license itself, um, my colleague Blake Richards has pointed out, according to Statistics Canada, less than 2% of the Canadian population does not have a driver's license. So I'm wondering, I mean, if you want to comment on that, I, I cannot see, for an example, where there would be anyone who voted in the last election who would not be able to vote in this coming election if our new provisions came in, yet they're saying that we're going to disenfranchise hundreds of thousands of people. I'd just like a comment. Well, there is, I have to say there's a startling lack of knowledge about, the, in the public, about the idea that is required. A lot of people wrong, a lot of very informed people wrongly think that you require photo ID. For example, the leader of the Green Party, who I consider to be very informed on uh, political matters, having run in campaigns uh, herself. I was under the impression uh, in a public letter she published recently that uh, that one needs photo identification to cast a ballot. In fact, that's not true. It is an option, but not an obligation. Elections Canada provides a second list of eligible identification uh, that includes 39 different options. Uh, and this lack of knowledge is important. And it's something we try to fix through the Fair Elections Act. Through Clause 7 of the bill, we are amending Section 18 to require Elections Canada inform people of the forms of identification that are required. The goal there is to ensure that people show up at the voting location with all the information that they need, including the ID. And I think that will help uh, solve some of these problems. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. We'll go to uh, Madame Lafondres, please, four minutes. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Thank you for coming, Minister. We appreciate that you've given us as much time as possible for asking questions. We have a lot of 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 questions. On utilise la carte d'identification des électeurs pour pouvoir aller voter. Maintenant, vous enlevez Now, complètement cette possibilité-là. Et euh, les jeunes ne pourront plus du tout utiliser cette mesure qui est un projet pilote en 2011 par le directeur de l'ordre des élections. Est-ce que vous vous rendez compte de comment ça va affecter négativement la participation des jeunes au processus électoral? Je vous remercie, l'honorable député, de sa question, mais je ne suis pas d'accord que ça va réduire la participation des jeunes. Pourquoi? Et premièrement, comme elle a dit, les jeunes, les étudiants ont voté sans l'usage de ce cette carte d'information uh, pendant des longues années For many et years, sans problème. Deuxièmement, Secondly, il y a 39 autres façons de s'identifier quand on fait le vote, yourself, uh, y compris le carte d'étudiant. Il y a aussi une, une grande liste There que je peux a, partager. Finalement, la loi sur l'intégrité des élections ob obligera Élection Canada d'informer des jeunes des identifications qui seront nécessaires pour voter. 
et ça, moi, je pense que ça va les aider à arriver avec tous les documents nécessaires. Je suis déjà au courant de tout ça, M. le ministre, mais quand vous répétez tout le temps qu'il y a 39 formes d'identification que les gens peuvent utiliser, est-ce que vous pouvez nous dire précisément combien de cartes d'identité peuvent être utilisées toutes seules pour aller voter? Mais les 39 dont je parle sont... Non, non, je vous demande combien seulement une carte d'identité seule pour aller voter combien? Oui, le, le, il y a, ça dépend de la province, mais les, les, les permis de conduite, par exemple, les cartes de santé, des cartes d'identification des provinces, des territoires, c'est déjà disponible. Ça, c'est une option. Là, c'est pas tout. Je dois, je dois vous corriger. Je dois vous corriger. Ce n'est pas tout. Parce qu'il y a une toute une autre option. C'est la deuxième option, c'est d'utiliser 39 d'autres formes d'identification et je le liste ici. Moi, quand j'étais étudiante à Mouski, j'ai eu mon permis de conduire très tard. Donc, quand M. le Président dit que 2 seulement des Canadiens ont pour leur permis de conduire, premièrement, moi, il permis que ces 25 des gens de la région de Mouski qui n'ont pas de permis de conduire, donc ça peut vraiment varier d'une place à l'autre. Et chez les jeunes, c'est évidemment ceux qui ont le moins de permis de conduire parce que plusieurs vont attendre de plus en plus longtemps pour aller chercher. Et quand vous parlez de « on peut utiliser la carte d'étudiante pour aller voter », ce n'est pas réaliste pour plein de jeunes qui n'ont pas de preuve de résidence et donc ils ne pourront pas utiliser leur carte d'identification d'étudiants pour aller voter. Mais de toute façon, j'ai d'autres questions que je vais ajouter. Je vais ajouter, ce n'est pas le seul. Ce, ce n'est pas le seul, le seul document euh, étudiant qui est, euh, qui est acceptable. Is Aussi, acceptable. Euh, ils peuvent utiliser la correspondance d'une école, d'un collège ou d'une université. Et aussi, d'autres 38 d'autres façons d'identifier. Mais ce n'est pas en enlevant les façons pour les étudiants d'aller voter qu'on va améliorer la participation des jeunes. Mais ce n'est pas en permettant une façon qui n'est pas sécuritaire qu'on va protéger notre système interne. Thank you. Uh, we will move to Mr. Richards for four minutes. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you for being here today, Minister. I've got a couple of questions. Uh, hopefully we'll have time for both. Um, I think we all remember uh, the 2006 uh, Liberal leadership campaign when, when many of the uh, candidates in that, uh, in that race used political loans to be able to circumvent the donation limits. Uh, and. In some of those cases, the candidates still, owe, in fact, owe money uh, to campaigns that ended almost a decade ago now. Um, so I wonder if you could tell us um, if, if, if and how the Fair Elections Act uh, closes that loophole and, and, and helps to keep big money out of politics, and, and if you could also uh, address um, whether, in fact, uh, those provisions in the Act would be retroactive and, what, and whether they could actually be applied to the individuals who still have debt from those 2006 campaigns and, and what the Elections Canada might then be able to do to re, uh, force repayment of those loans. I'd like to begin, if I may, Mr. Chair, by putting the present situation in context. Um, under the present law, uh, the Commissioner of Canada Elections has the power to investigate anyone has, who has used loans deliberately to circumvent donation limits. That would be a clear offense under the existing uh, section 497 of the Canada Elections Act. Now, Elections Canada rightly points out that failure to repay pay a loan does not necessarily improve, in, uh, does not necessarily prove intent, and therefore is not automatically a, an offence under the Act, uh, although it is a, a non-contravention. Uh, sorry, it is a non-compliance. Uh, is non uh, It is non-compliance with the Act. However. Elections Canada does have all the powers to investigate whether these Liberal leadership contenders deliberately used loans to circumvent donation limits. Uh, and it remains to be seen whether Elections Canada intends uh, to, uh, to carry out such an investigation. Um, that being said, uh, the changes to the election, the, in the Fair Elections Act will close this loophole altogether so that, um, so that people cannot use unpaid debts uh, to circumvent donation limits. It, it, um, it does this by requiring that uh, borrowers use recognized financial institutions or political parties that they have commercial repayment plans and interest rates, uh, and that it does become an automatic offense after three years of non-repayment. Now, that provision is not uh, retrospective. It will not apply to past uh, incurred debts. 
Uh, however, uh, we are, for those who do have outstanding debts, we are making it, uh, giving them some flexibility and repaying them. They will be allowed to collect donations from previous donors as long as they do not exceed the annual uh, donation limit. And those provisions will be retrospective. In, it, in other words, existing uh, past incurred debts can be reimbursed through this, uh, this uh, change in, um, in the fundraising side. Thank you, Minister. Um, I think most people in this room know that, I, that the riding I represent is a large rural riding, and one of the challenges sometimes can be in some of the smaller communities finding appropriate polling stations. One of the reasons uh, you know, shared to me by the, the previous uh, returning officer in my riding was sometimes uh, finding a proper place where disabled people are able to have a proper access to the polling station uh, could be a challenge in some of those communities. And I know that one of the changes being made in, in a Fair Elections Act is actually going to uh, require the CEO to communicate with people with disabilities to ensure that they know what polling stations, voting stations are available to them uh, when they get to the polling station. And uh, I wonder if you could tell, uh, tell us a little bit more about uh, why that's necessary and whether you, in fact, met with uh, representatives uh, of disabled uh, uh, individuals uh, and uh, discussed uh, the development of that with, with them and um, ensure that it was something that would... Uh, you know, uh, be well applied to uh, to ensure they had the proper access and the knowledge of where and how to vote. So I'm going to ask Mr. Opitz to see if the minister can answer the question on his time. Minister, if you wouldn't mind answering that question, go ahead. I think the system provides excellent tools to help uh, disabled people vote right now. The problem is a lot of disabled uh, Canadians do not are not aware of those tools. And so often they decide not to go and vote out of... Uh, concern that they won't be able to cast their ballot upon arrival. Uh, that's a concern that I heard from organizations like People First, the Canadian National Institute for the Blind. Uh, and, um, you know, it's not helpful to have uh, Braille services if uh, a visually impaired person doesn't know that they can acquire those services. So the Fair Elections Act uh, in Clause 7 will require Elections Canada inform the disabled of the special tools available to help them vote. Uh, that uh, measure has been applauded by the Canadian National Institute for the Blind uh, and, uh, and others, and uh, I think that it will be helpful in encouraging turnout again, uh, among uh, Canadian uh, disabled people. Uh, Minister? You uh, you have something here that uh, I don't think anybody's touched on yet, and I apologize, I'm still getting over a bit of a cold. Um, the advisory committee of, on polit uh, political parties to the CEO. There's a provision there where they would meet uh, once a year to be able to uh, to talk to the CEO and give him uh, guidance on uh, on issues, and, and he would provide guidance back. Can you uh, can you discuss that? Yes, uh, we there, the. Advisory Committee of Political Parties already does exist. Uh, this will create a uh, legal recognition of it. Uh, and it will require the uh, CEO to consult with this committee when he changes uh, his interpretations uh, so that um, parties can provide some input on the impact those changes will have on their operations. Uh, I think this is a, a practical, non-binding tool that will allow political parties and the uh, CEO to exchange information, make good decisions and, and uh, rulings. There's also a, a section that, that provides better customer service, it's, it's, um, it refers to. Now, I, I'd like a little better definition on that. To me, that means that uh, it makes it easier and, and clearer and fairer and, and more convenient for people to vote. Can you, can you describe that concept within the Act? Yes. Um, Canadians, uh, two million Canadians voted in advanced ballots in the last election. Uh, that's very positive. A lot of people are busy on Elections Day. We want to give them as many opportunities as possible to vote early, and that's why we're adding an advance ballot day. It's an extra day of voting for all Canadians to use. We're also going to require Elections Canada advertise that advance voting day so that people are aware that it exists. Uh, finally, um, we are going to uh, allow Elections Canada more resources to uh, provide uh, officials that, who can relieve congestion at busy voting stations, and uh, that will make it for shorter wait times and less confusion when people show up to cast their ballot. Okay. On the, um, the delineation between